Welcome back to the Dr. Doug Show. Today, we're going to do another of our monthly AMA or Ask Me Anything. And the way we do this is we go through the comments on YouTube and we look to see which are the comments that are most commonly used, commonly asked, so that we can bring that to our the biggest audience. So today, we're going to do some topics around hormones, some topics around the drugs, specifically around how the anabolics are different than the anti-resorptive drugs. We're going to talk a little bit about men and osteoporosis, slightly different group, but have several questions around men with osteoporosis. So glad to be getting these questions so we can bring this forward uh, and a couple other things that we will get through towards the end. So let's go ahead and get started and let's talk about the drugs. So the question was specific to the drugs Forteo and Temlos around the concerning risk of osteonecrosis of the jaw with the anti-resorptives. So let me just give a little background here. So the drugs that are most commonly used that the guidelines recommend out of the gate for most patients is to use an anti-resorptive drug that is going to be like your Fosamax, your Reclast, your bisphosphonate drugs, or the Prolia drug. Now, these drugs slow down bone resorption and will, in my opinion, squash bone metabolism, which makes it difficult to actually grow bone. There is a time and a place for those drugs, but one of the risks is this thing called osteonecrosis of the jaw. And osteonecrosis of the jaw is exactly what it sounds like, which is dead or dying bone. It can be associated with fracture but generally it has to do it with doing dental work, getting extractions or implants or whatever um, while you're on one of these drugs and then having a bad outcome as a result of it. And the problem with the jaw and the bone drugs is that the jaw is under more rapid bone metabolism. And I always talk about bone metabolism with the bone all over the body where you're always building up and breaking down bone. And in order to reverse osteoporosis, we simply need to build up more than we're breaking down, right? But in the jaw, because we stress our teeth through eating, through grinding, if you're a grinder, all of these things are going to stress the jaw more and the bone and the jaw, therefore, is under more rapid breakdown and buildup. So then if you go on a drug that shuts down bone metabolism and you stress the jaw, especially if you have a surgery, an implant, an extraction, then you can end up with dead bone in there and you can end up with fracture. And this is a very bad scenario. And so this can be absolutely debilitating, not always, but it's a really bad thing and you definitely want to avoid it. And this is why I don't like to use these anti-resorptive drugs unless we need to, and for only the time that we need to. Now, the question was about the anabolics though. So Forteo and Timlos work in a different pathway. They actually support bone metabolism. They're actually building up bone metabolism. And when you do that, you're actually working with all of the other things that you're doing for your bones. So that could be your exercise, your nutrition, your impact training, like all those things, right? This is why we do use those drugs occasionally if we need to for people that are at high fracture risk. And so the question is, is do these drugs associate with osteonecrosis of the jaw the same way? And the answer is no, because we're not squashing bone metabolism. We're not slowing down osteoclast function. We're actually supporting bone metabolism. And you see this in the large randomized control trials that were done for the FDA approval. You did not see a single case of osteonecrosis of the jaw. All right now, the next topic here is a question around weighted vests in heel drops. So I'm going to just read the question here. The author says, Dr. Doug, thanks for this helpful video. I'm assuming this is the one on weighted vest. I was wondering whether the impact necessary to spark an increase in bone mineral density from a heel drop could be safely enhanced by wearing a weighted vest when doing the heel drop. I couldn't find any studies on this. Thanks again for sharing your knowledge. So I've looked at this too, because I think it would be interesting to do, but I have also not found any studies on this. But let's just think about this from a, a physiologic perspective. So we know that a heel drop can produce over four multiples of body weight. Even in the lower extremity, the threshold in theory for the impetus to build bone is four multiples of body weight. So a heel drop done barefoot on a hard surface with the right technique can generate that much uh, force. So heel drop is an effective tool if done well. It can also be a dangerous tool, so please do it carefully. Get trained on how to do it right. Adding a weighted vest would likely increase the multiples of body weight because you're increasing the body weight, right? And so, although artificially. So it, in theory would be a good way to increase the multiples of body weight. But the question that I would ask is, is it safe? Are your joints going to be able to tolerate it? And is it necessary? So again, hasn't been studied. Probably depends on your starting point. You know, if you're underweight and adding... 10% of your body weight and then doing heel drops, that's different than if you're overweight and adding 10% of your body weight. So this could be interesting. I think some people who are underweight maybe could consider this, but again, you got to make sure you're doing it right and you got to start low, go slow and work up gradually because these high impact maneuvers 
can actually result in, even though it doesn't seem like much, but these can result in trauma, can result in fractures, can result in injuries. So please be careful. This next one's about scoliosis. And we hear concerns around scoliosis often, and this is kind of a touchy one because we also know that DEXA doesn't report T-score well for someone that has rotation of their spine. And so for those of you not familiar with really what scoliosis is, it's just simply a rotation of the spine and there's different ways to measure it. This question specifically says, what exercises can scoliosis patients do if they have osteoporosis, lifting heavy weights, and high impact is contraindicated? That's not entirely true. It might be for this particular case. It depends on their situation. But generally, especially mild, moderate scoliosis, impact training would not be contraindicated and resistance training is not contraindicated. But if they have other spine pathology, if they have pain, if they have joint problems, if they have whatever associated with scoliosis, it certainly could be. And also severe scoliosis could be because the curvature gets too challenging to deal with. So it really depends on the, the unique situation. But the reason why I wanted to answer this question is because we all have our physical limitations. So if someone has severe scoliosis, for example, how can they do impact? How can they do resistance training? and work around that limitation. And there are definitely ways to do it, but this is where you have to get creative and probably need to work with a trainer or somebody who understands your limitation very well, you specifically, not just scoliosis across the board. And remember too, that you can isolate your lower extremities and do a lot of things, you know, so you can actually work your lower extremity and not engage your spine at all. But of course we do want to load the spine in whatever way that we can. And again, this is going to depend on your unique situation, your unique limitations. All right, now this next one is a hormone question, and this is a question that we get a lot. This is a confusion around different forms and routes of hormones, specifically estradiol. So this question is around vaginal estradiol. So the question is simply asking, uh, would vaginal estradiol have a similar effect on the bone regarding the bone turnover markers? And so what we have to understand about the vaginal products is that in general, they are made to resolve symptoms locally for GSM, genitourinary syndrome of menopause, right? So this is vaginal dryness, atrophy, chronic UTI, painful intercourse, et cetera. Therefore, they are not designed to have a systemic exposure to the body, meaning they're not designed for you to have measurable levels elsewhere. And this is why they should be considered safe for women who are breast cancer survivors, for women who are trying to avoid estrogen systemically for whatever reason, they should be able to use vaginal estradiol because it's not absorbed systemically. Now that said, there are some products that could be prescribed at a high enough strength to actually do that too, but that's not generally how they're made. The femoring, for example, has a, a lower and a higher strength dose and the higher strength ring actually does show some systemic absorption. So we just have to be careful. But generally, vaginal products are not going to have systemic exposure. Therefore, they are not going to change the bone turnover markers the way that we talk about with systemic exposure through whatever, cream, patch, gel, you know, pellet, injection, et cetera. All right, now this next one's a nutrition question. And I'm going to read this because I, I think it's, I'm going to read how it was written because I think it'll help to explain how I'm going to answer it. So the, the question goes like this. It's actually more of a statement. There's a question in here too. It goes like this. I don't know why you would recommend high fat dairy. I go out of my way to look for fat free versions. Who wants to have more saturated fat in their diet? Also red meat, dangerous saturated fat. There are ways to have healthy bones and a healthy heart. People do your homework. I think she's talking about me. So the reason why I read this is not to, to make fun of this person. So many people, especially in the generation of women in their you know, 50s and 60s and 70s, were raised, and I was raised in the same way, to fear dietary fat in general, but definitely to fear saturated fat. So we have a lot of people who search for, if they're going to consume dairy, fat-free dairy, because it doesn't have any saturated fat, right? Same thing with red meat. Avoid red meat at all costs. Eat chicken and pork because it doesn't have saturated fat. It must be better. So saturated fat's kind of an interesting dietary source of fat, because <clears throat> if you think about saturated fat in the body, we are full of saturated fat, right? Every cell on our body is lined with saturated fat. It is literally our cell membranes. So I don't think that it's even rational to think that saturated fat for most humans is going to be a bad thing. And we know that this is true. The, the modern literature on this is absolutely clear that for the vast majority of people, saturated fat is not dangerous, does not raise cholesterol. It does not raise cardiovascular risk. So saturated fat is a problem for some people though. There are genetic predispositions, specifically the APOE4 allele, that genotype, if you have that, then you're likely going to be intolerant to saturated fat. There are other SNPs in there too. So genetics certainly could play a role. But for most people, saturated fat is not a problem. And here's the problem if you cut it out. So if you consume dairy without fat, what's left? 
especially like skim milk, for example, right? So if you're consuming a highly processed, I'd consider that an ultra processed food, right? They went through the process of homogenizing, they went through the process of pasteurizing, and then they cut out all the fat. Like this is an ultra processed food. What's left is sugar. It's mostly lactose, right? That's actually really hard on the gut. And so while it does have some protein in it, likely this has been watered down. This is not a whole food product. So I prefer to consume foods in their whole form. And that's going to include dietary fat for those that can tolerate it and saturated fat for those that can tolerate it. So I don't like fat-free milk. I was actually raised on fat-free milk and Honey Nut Cheerios because it was fat-free and that wrecked my metabolism. So I don't think we should be avoiding it for the vast majority of people. I think we have just scared two generations of both women and men away from saturated fat. And it's really unfortunate because it's actually an excellent nutrient source. So again, find out your genetics, know that it's a problem for you, use biomarkers to verify that, inflammatory markers, lipids, et cetera. And if it's a problem, you can work around it. But if not, saturated fat through dairy is a fantastic fuel source. Saturated fat through red meat is a great fuel source, a highly nutritious meat source. Skipping red meat to go to chicken and pork because it has less saturated fat, you are going from an animal that has four stomachs and can process out all kinds of toxins from the food that it's consuming to give you highly nutritious quality protein to a chicken which is going to consume usually GMO grain filled with, you know, mold and pesticides. And because it only has one stomach and it's super tiny, it's going to pass all that right along to you. So chicken is not a better protein source. Pork is not a better protein source. Red meat from cows, because they're ruminants, is a superior protein source across the board, as long as you can tolerate the saturated fat. All right, our next one is another hormone question. Again, I'm going to read this one because it's there's a lot in here. So she says, when I was six years postmenopause, I could no longer handle the vaginal atrophy and UTIs. Although most of my other symptoms of menopause had subsided, finally, I went to a doctor and he prescribed me estradiol and progesterone, both oral. I asked about cream instead of oral, and he said that there was no greater risk or side effect of oral. Is that true? Should I insist on a cream? Also, he would not prescribe me any testosterone to boost libido because he said it's dangerous. Okay, lots of things in here. We'll go backwards. So first of all, testosterone is not dangerous. And I think it's really unfortunate that you have a doctor who is saying that it's dangerous, probably has never read a research study on testosterone. It's actually extremely well tolerated. It is very beneficial for women who need it. And the side effect profile is very mild, especially if dosed appropriately. And there are no big risks, especially if it's dosed appropriately, meaning that if we are replacing you to where you were, where you are optimal, then there's really not a lot to worry about other than the potential androgenic side effects that would be like oily skin, acne, hair loss. But generally that is, you can do something about that with the way that it's metabolized. You can adjust the dose, et cetera. To say that it's dangerous, don't use it, just shows ignorance on, on his part. And then regarding the oral estradiol, so this is actually debatable. I think there are multiple studies out there, as there is one, but there's multiple studies that show that oral forms of estradiol, because they metabolize into products that are thrombogenic, there is an increased risk of blood clot. Not all studies show it though. Now, some of the other studies showing that oral estrogens like conjugated equine estrogen have this risk are a little bit biased and skewed because you're not using an oral estradiol. So I do know lots of doctors that use oral estradiol. There's plenty of large companies out there, telehealth companies out there that will use an oral estradiol. So I'm not saying don't do it. I just think that because the transdermal estradiols are so well tolerated and have a better safety profile, and there is usually a form that most women are going to be able to tolerate, a patch, a gel, a cream, because that is a viable option, why expose yourself to the risk? Now, if a woman said to me, I want to use an oral product. I understand that there's a slight increased risk of blood clot, but this is the way that I want to take it. I'm not going to say no, but in general, I prefer a transdermal option because it has a safer profile. All right. And then finally, I've had multiple questions about osteoporosis in men. And I, I know I don't actually do a lot of content for men because a men are less likely to be diagnosed with osteoporosis because they start with more bone density than women, but also they're generally not looking for it. So I'm glad we're actually getting men on the channel asking these questions. So thank you for asking these questions. But here's the deal. So not much changes when you look at our approach to men and women. Obviously, the hormone conversation is different. But outside of that, everything else is the same. If we're going to use something like a weight-based protocol for, like for a supplement or for protein or whatever, then we have to adjust. But outside of that, 
all the recommendations are the same. Now, from a hormone perspective, obviously testosterone replacement is different than HRT. Now, TRT is a whole another topic. I'm not going to get into all the details, but the reason why I bring it up is to say that testosterone in men has been studied to show that if you replace it appropriately, you can see an increase in bone mineral density. Now, your doctor might tell you that we can't use this for osteoporosis because, well, clearly it's not indicated for that according to the FDA, but also it doesn't show reduction in fracture risk. And that is concerning, except that if you look at the studies on testosterone, they are not long enough and they are not big enough to ever have shown a reduction in fracture risk. So I don't think it's that it doesn't do it. I just think we haven't studied it to show it. But we do see in our practice for men that go on testosterone that need it based off of symptoms and biomarkers, they do see exponentially faster development of bone mineral density than those that don't. I got a great story about that. The 64-year-old guy, retired attorney, great guy. When he started with us and the program, we did mostly lifestyle stuff. So nutrition, sleep, stress. He had just retired, so stress was a big thing for him. He was a cyclist too, so he was doing a lot of chronic cardio, not a lot of resistance training. And he was shocked by his diagnosis. So in the first year, <clears throat> we did all those things and he did see improvement, but it was slow, you know, and it was still like significant, but it was slow. When we added testosterone, man, it took off like a rocket. So hormones for both men and women are going to exponentially increase the benefits that you're, that you're seeing from the other things that you're doing. So true for men, true for women. The one last thing about testosterone for men is that we know that estrogen, estradiol specifically, is a very powerful tool for your bones. Works on both slowing down bone loss and improving bone building. Works on both sides of the equation the way we want it to. Men do not make any appreciable amount of estradiol on their own. They have to convert it from testosterone. So men that have low testosterone are going to have low levels of estrogen too. Of course, you should test to verify, but we see it almost universally. A man has low testosterone, he has low estradiol, he is at risk for bone loss. So when it comes to hormones for men, generally we're going to be not aggressive, but we're going to have this conversation around, you know, what are your symptoms? What do your biomarkers look like? If you have low levels of estrogen, we need to decide if testosterone is right for you. But outside of that, the treatment is pretty much the same, lifestyle-based, biomarker-driven supplementation hormone optimization. All right, that's it for today. Thank you so much for your time. And remember that a diagnosis of osteoporosis isn't the end, but deciding to reverse it's a beginning. I'll see you in the next video.